You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Jonah, chapter 4. Jonah, chapter 4. And we'll read all of the chapter before we open in prayer. You may wonder why I do that, read the same passage of Scripture over and over each week. It's because it takes us that long to actually go through that passage of Scripture. That's one reason, but the second is that there is a healthy benefit to repetition in reading the same passages of Scripture over and over and over. And one of the goals that we strive for here in all of our teaching ministry is not just so that you can come and hear somebody teach or preach, but so that you will get the passage in your head, that you will hear it and become so familiar with the passage and all of the details of it and the meaning of it Uh, that God will be able to use that to change your heart, and that's what we strive for. And so that is why we read passages over and over again. So Jonah chapter 4, it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. The Lord said, Do you have good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm when the dawn came the next day. And it attacked the plant, and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry even to death. Then the Lord said, You have compassion on the plant for which you did not work, which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals? Let's pray together. Our Father, we have nothing that we have not first received from you, and one of the most valuable and precious gifts that you have given to us is your word. And it is with confident expectation that we approach it now, believing that you will speak to us through it in the pages of Holy Scripture, It is by your word that you sanctify us and that you heal us, that you cleanse us, that you feed us, and we are dependent upon you to understand it and to rightly apply it. So we pray that your spirit now would be our teacher as we look at these passages together in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I love about the Bible is the honesty with which the Bible describes the human condition and human experiences. It's not whitewashed. And even the biblical authors like Moses and Joshua and Ezra and Nehemiah and Jonah who describe their own life or events that happened in their own life and their own responses to those events, they are brutally honest, not just with what they, what happened to them, but they're brutally honest in their own, about their own reactions to the things that happened to them. We see uh, David, for instance, in fear, calling out to God, begging God not only to hear him, but to deliver him. We see David wrestling with different emotions and fear and angst and and, uh, sometimes even paranoia and then other times that confident resting and trusting in God. We see Job work through all of the emotions of having a calamity strike him and wondering why did God do this? Why would God allow this to happen? We see men like uh, 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 other psalmists like Asaph who wrestle with the prosperity of the wicked and why they sit in ease. And why God seems to not punish them, but instead afflicts 
and allows affliction upon His own people. You see people wrestling with God, begging with God, pleading with God, sometimes even arguing with God. Those are honest emotions that you and I can relate to, and and none of them are whitewashed for us. And it's the same here in the book of Jonah. We saw last week that there is never a time when anger with God is acceptable. It's understandable. We understand what causes it. We understand what happens uh, through our anger and why we become anger. But it's never acceptable. It's never okay to be angry with God because it's never right to have righteous indignation against a completely righteous being. And yet Jonah, in a very candid and forthright way, says in chapter 4, verse 1, that he became angry with God. A very honest admission that in light of everything that had happened and all that God had done, Jonah became angry. And he bears with uh, with an honesty that just makes one blush. He bears the own, his own condition of his heart and bears out what is on his soul and what God is doing in him and how he feels about it and what he's wrestling with. And we saw that Jonah was angry with God. And last week we looked at Jonah's anger. And we looked at why it is that you and I become angry with God. And we looked at the heart condition behind our anger with God. We are angry with God, you will remember, because, and it always boils down to this, God does something, or He allows something to happen, but usually God does something or acts in a way that you and I do not appreciate or understand. And the heart attitude behind that anger is always the same, and that is, If I were on the throne of the universe, I would be a better sovereign than God is. That's the heart attitude. And then when God does something that we do not appreciate or we do not understand, we respond or can respond with anger. We looked at that last week. This week we're looking at Jonah's appeal in verses 2 and 3, and then God's answer to Jonah in verse 4. I want you to read verses 2 and 3 again with me. This is Jonah's appeal. He prayed to the Lord and he said, Please, Lord. Was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. The contrast between this prayer in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 4 and the prayer in chapter 2 could not be more stark. Remember the prayer in chapter 2? The prayer in chapter 2, we have a Jonah who is humbled, he's repentant, he is thankful to God for the grace that God showed him in delivering him from death. We see a man who is familiar with Scripture and was ready to pay back to God. I will pay the vows, the vows that I have made. I will sacrifice to you with a vow of thanksgiving, with a thankful heart, because salvation is of the Lord. He was a repentant man, a humbled man, a thankful man, a grateful man in every way restored to God through his repentance. And then in chapter 4, what a different picture, huh? Lord, isn't this what I said was going to happen back when I was in my own country? Do you remember we had this conversation and I knew what kind of a God you are and because you're this type of a God, I knew what you were going to do and I wanted to cut you off at the pass. In order to forestall this very thing, that's why I fled and went to Tarshish. Because you're a good and compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness. I knew what you would do. I knew it was coming. So just kill me now. Wow, what a difference between chapter 2 and chapter 4, huh? In chapter 4, we see this man who was humbled and repentant. Now he's just being brutally honest with God about how he feels. And wrestling with God about what God has done. The contrast is stark. There is a reason, the reason behind Jonah's disobedience is finally given to us in chapter 4, verse 2. I want you to imagine that you were reading through the book of Jonah for the very first time, and you start in chapter 1, and God gives the command. Now, just try and erase the rest of the story from your mind for just a second. God gives the command, and Jonah flees. And if you're reading that for the very first time, you would think to yourself, what is this guy doing? What type of insanity has popped into his mind that he would respond to a command of God like this? This is a prophet of God. And you would read through chapter 1 almost in vain, in vain, in fact, looking for a reason why Jonah would do such a thing. And you go through chapter 2 looking for a reason. You wouldn't find a reason for his rebellion. Chapter 3, you wouldn't find a reason for his rebellion. You finally get to chapter 4, verse 2, and this is where Jonah reveals 
why it is that he fled. Was it not this what I said when I was in my own country? And it is for this reason that I fled and went to Tarshish. Now we finally get the reason behind his rebellion in chapter 1. And here's where Jonah reveals to us why he fled. Some people have speculated, and I've heard sermons on this in Bible college from very well-meaning people, where they will say the reason that Jonah fled was because he was terrified of the Ninevites. He was fearful of his own life. They were a brutal, violent, vicious people. And Jonah feared that if he went to Nineveh and he proclaimed the word of God to them, that they would kill him and skin him alive and put his head on a stick outside the city like they did to all their enemies. So Jonah was terrified for his life. Others have speculated and say Jonah was worried about his reputation. And if he had a successful ministry in Nineveh or he went to the Ninevites, what would his fellow countrymen think? Others have speculated that the reason that Jonah fled was because this was just too much, too overwhelming task for Jonah. It's just preaching to a whole city, going all that distance, is just too much for this frail old man. And so he decided to leave and go out on the, on the ship and, and disobey God's word. And all of that speculation. Jonah wasn't fearful for his life. He asked the sailors to kill him in chapter 1. He begs here for God to kill him in chapter 4, verse 3. And later on in chapter 4, he asked for death again. Was Jonah afraid to die? He wasn't afraid to die. Had he gone to Nineveh and they said, you know what? One more word and we're going to skin you alive and put your head on a stick outside of our city. Jonah would have started talking. He would have rather had the Ninevites kill him than have the Ninevites repent and be saved by God. He didn't fear death. Was he worried about his reputation? No. No prophet was honored in his own hometown. None of those prophets concerned about their reputation. They were hated by their countrymen and people in leadership all the time. No true prophet of God had a massive following in his own land. None of them did. He wasn't worried about his reputation. Was it just too overwhelming for him? I don't think it was. Just get on a camel and ride to Nineveh. Get up and, and preach your message. You could do that in Israel. It wasn't an overwhelming task. No, the reason behind his rebellion was far more sinister than that. It wasn't lack of, of uh, courage, and it wasn't lack of ability, friends. He wanted Nineveh destroyed. That's it. That's the bottom line. He wanted to see a million Ninevites, upwards of a million Ninevites, be destroyed and be wiped out in Sodom and Gomorrah fashion, in worldwide flood type fashion. A total destruction of his enemies. That's what he was after. Why would Jonah have such a heart like that toward Nineveh? Have you ever stopped to wonder what might have been going on in the historical context? I've been waiting until this point to bring this out. But I, and this is somewhat, somewhat speculation. So bear with me and don't, don't go to the wall for this. And if you're ever on Jeopardy and they ask you a question about this, don't give them this answer and say, my pastor told me, because you would embarrass me. This may not be true, but I think we can sort of connect some historical dots. And let me give you something to sort of put this in perspective. Jonah and Hosea were contemporaries. That means they lived at the same period of time as each other. I think it's safe to assume, because of how the prophets hung out, there were schools of prophets, the prophets knew each other, they corresponded with each other, that Jonah was familiar with Hosea's prophecy, and that Hosea knew Jonah and what had happened with Jonah. I think that the two men must have known each other. They prophesied at the same period of time for the same group of people in the same general area. Hosea had already revealed that Assyria was going to be the instrument through which God would judge the northern kingdom. He had revealed that through Hosea. He told Hosea, the northern kingdom is going to be taken captive and they are going to eat the bread in the nation of Assyria. That is going to be my judgment upon those people. Now God has told Jonah, I am about to destroy Nineveh. You go to Nineveh and proclaim to them my message. And now Jonah is doing the math. God said he's going to use Assyria to punish Israel, my people. And he's just told me that he's going to destroy the Assyrians. In order for him to use the Assyrians to punish my people, he's going to have to spare the Assyrians. And now he's told me to go and preach to Assyria against their wickedness. Do you think that Jonah may have connected the dots and said to himself, mercy for Nineveh equals judgment for my people. If God is going to use Assyria to punish Israel, he must spare Assyria and not judge it. And if I go and I preach, God's design must be to spare Assyria. That is why I think Jonah says, was this not what I said while I was in my own country? I knew that you would do this because this is the type of God that you are. See, Jonah had a double standard. 
Jonah wanted grace for himself and judgment for others. That was his double standard. And Jonah is angry. He's angry not at the Ninevites for repenting. He's angry not at himself for going and obeying. He's angry at God for sparing the city. And so Jonah is mad at God because God didn't destroy Nineveh but spared them. Now I ask you this. Had God done anything for Nineveh that God had not done for Israel? Anything? Had God done anything for Nineveh that he had not already done for Israel? The answer to that is no. You see, Jonah was a prophet. He enjoyed the prophetic office. He heard from God and he ministered to the people. He enjoyed the temple. He enjoyed the presence of God in the temple and the sacrifice and the feasts and the law and the priesthood and the Levitical covenants and all of the old covenant, all the blessings of the covenant. He lived in the promised land. He looked forward to the Messiah when God would redeem the nation. He enjoyed all of those spiritual blessings, all of those physical blessings. And what had God done for Assyria? He had simply stayed judgment and withheld judgment and spared them from the results of their sin. That's all God had done. And what does Jonah do? He responds with anger. Why? Because Nineveh got a sliver, just a sliver of blessing compared to the nation of Israel. This is endemic in the human heart, and you know it as well as I do. You take Johnny and Susie, and you give Johnny a bowl of ice cream, and he is just as happy as a rat until you give Susie a bowl of ice cream. Once you give Susie a bowl of ice cream, even, listen, even if that bowl of ice cream is smaller, Johnny will be somewhat resentful not only that Susie got a bowl of ice cream, but that she got as much ice cream as she did. I see this in children, not in particular, all the time. All the time. You give one of them this and another one this. And if they are not absolutely identical, there are times when I think, man, the only way to avoid a meltdown here is if I get out a scale and I weigh this ice cream against that ice cream and make sure that they're in identical bowls. Why? Because endemic in the human heart, woven into the human heart, is a desire to see ourselves blessed and others not so much. I see myself in Jonah. Do you? God blesses your neighbor, and all of a sudden you're discontent with what you have. I was content until he got that. Now he has that. Now I need to have that too, or at least something like that, preferably something better than that. And if you just stopped for a second and looked at what God has given to you, you'd realize you've been blessed in far greater measure than your neighbor has. But we're discontent. Why? Because our neighbor has a sliver of what we enjoy. And discontentment raises, rises in our hearts. Now, Jonah had a double standard. And do you notice what he is doing when he prays to the Lord? And he says, Lord, was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. You see what Jonah is doing? He is justifying his earlier disobedience. Do you notice that? Lord, this is why I fled. So you didn't know that, did you? But this is the reason I fled earlier. Why I left, the, re- the whole rebellion thing, this was it. This is why I left. And what Jonah is doing is justifying his own disobedience. He's excusing it. It's inexcusable, but he is trying to excuse it and to give a reason for it. And he's reasoning with God. See, this is why I disobeyed. As if the Lord is going to say, now I get it, Jonah. I see your point now. And you and I do this all the time. We rationalize our sin and talk it over with the Lord as if we have reason to be involved in it, reason to engage in it, and reason to participate in it. As if the Lord's going to simply say, now I understand why you're sinning. And in light of your circumstances, it's completely excusable and completely acceptable. It's almost as if that's what Jonah is doing. Lord, this is why I fled. I mean, even though he acknowledged that he was wrong, he repented of it, and he turned from that, now he's looking at the circumstances or the results of his obedience, and he is trying to show the Lord, see, my disobedience, that's why I did it. He goes back to a previous disobedience and begins to give excuses for it and to try and justify it, as if you can justify that disobedience. Now, Jonah's repentance was real. It was genuine when he did repent, but now he looks back on his earlier disobedience, and he says, This is why I did it, Lord. Here's here's the excuse for that. You can't excuse it, can you? Then look what Jonah says. For I knew 
Now, remember what the king of Nineveh said? The king of Nineveh said, who knows? God may relent, turn from his burning anger. Who knows? Who knows? Now, Jonah says, I know. I knew that you were a gracious God and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and that you would re- re- relent of your anger and that you would forgive the penitent and that you would show grace and that you would be forgiving and loving. Lord, I knew this about you. Now, all Jonah is doing is he is, he is quoting Scripture. He's quoting Exodus chapter 34, where the, it says, The Lord passed in front of him, that is Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and the fourth generations. That's the passage that Jonah is quoting from. And this is repeated all over in the Old Testament. This was the standard Hebrew way of understanding the nature and character of God. I could give you hundreds of these, but I'll only give you two more. Psalm 86, 15. You, O Lord God, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth. Joel 2, 13. Return to the Lord your God. He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil. So Jonah's just quoting Scripture back to God. And he's saying to the Lord, Lord, I knew this about you because your, your word, Scripture says, this is the type of God you are. But notice, and this is very subtle, what the implication of the quotation from Scripture is. The implication is, God, these are very regrettable weaknesses. You notice this? Lord, I knew this would happen because this is how you are. And if you weren't that way, this whole disaster of Nineveh repenting and being spared could have been avoided. But because you are like this, therefore I'm angry. Therefore we have this whole situation, this city that now is being spared. And I'm mad about it. And we have a whole group of people that's no longer going to be destroyed. And if you weren't so compassionate, then things would be much better. If you weren't so gracious and loving, things would be much better. If you weren't this way, you would have destroyed Nineveh and everything would have turned out in a much better way. That's why Jonah is angry. So Jonah knows the type of God that God is. And he quotes Scripture and he understands God's character. But here he begins to actually impugn God's character. And those things which are virtues in the character and nature of God, Jonah actually sees them as vices, as weaknesses, as defects of character. It's very subtle. This is what anger with God, this is what sin in the mind and in the heart will do. It will make us look at the character of God and those things which are his virtues we will view as vices. And in turn, we will look at our own defects and view them as vices. Jonah's narrowness, his bigotedness, his anger, his resentment, his hatred for Nineveh, all of those were virtues in Jonah's mind. His own virtues. And it was God's compassion and graciousness which were to blame for this disaster of Nineveh being spared. Isn't that insidious? And then, as diabolical as it might go, he actually quotes Scripture to God to prove how defective his character is. This is insidious. To quote the Bible back to God as if to imply it's because you're like this that this has happened. That is to put yourself up above God and to suggest, Lord, once again, if I were on the throne of the universe, things would be so much better. That's that's just virtually what Jonah is saying in quoting that in the, quoting that Bible verse back to God. Have you ever read chapter four and asked yourself, who in his right mind would ever respond like this? Jonah is upset that he was successful in his ministry. Most preachers that I know, and I know quite a few, they get discouraged when they're not successful. Jonah, on the other hand, is discouraged because he was successful. You know how many preachers there are who would love to have a response like this from a group of people that they preach or teach to? I've preached a lot of sermons. I tried to kind of add them up this, over this last week to give myself some idea, and then I got really depressed, and so I stopped. But I've preached a lot of sermons, and I've never in my life had a response like this from anything. Every time I get up and preach, I hope that there's going to be some sort of response in somebody's heart, and I'm encouraged when I see it's the case. 
Every time we get up and we uh, do a gospel message in an Awana event or something like that, I'm always hoping that there are going to be people there who will hear the gospel and respond rightly. And if one or two people were to ever come up to me after an event and say, you know what, I trusted Christ right here tonight because of what you said, I would just be melting down with glee and happiness over it. And Jonah has an entire city that turns and repents and gets saved and is spared a, a disaster. And what does he do? He just melts down in anger. Now, if Jonah had been a failure and not a success in Nineveh, would he have been happy? He would have been happy. And can you imagine him returning back to his hometown? And people ask him, how was your ministry in Nineveh? It was a train wreck. It was a total failure. It was the best thing I've ever seen in my life. I preached to those people like rocks. They didn't hear a word I said. Not a single person responded. They mocked, they ridiculed, they threatened to kill me, and I left the town. It was the best ministry I've had ever. How irrationally incongruous is this in, in thinking? That a man would look at a success like that and respond the way Jonah does. Jeremiah, the Lord, knowing that Jeremiah would be discouraged by, discouraged by the lack of response, the Lord said to Jeremiah, I want you to go and I want you to preach, but you have to understand, the people are not going to listen to you. So don't expect large followings. Don't expect large crowds. Don't expect people to repent. Don't expect people to turn around because their hearts are hardened and they're not going to respond. Amos, Hosea, Jeremiah, Isaiah, any other Old Testament prophet would love to have had a response to their message like Jonah got. Love to have had it. And Jonah gets it and he's angry. Isn't that insane? Just utterly insane. Do you know, and I don't say this in any irreverent way, let me qualify it so you don't misunderstand me and misquote me later. Jesus did not have a response to his preaching like Jonah had to his. It's not because Jesus was inferior to Jonah in any way. By the providence and the sovereignty of God, Jesus ended up with far fewer followers than when he started with because the things that he said were hard to hear and many people left him. And Jesus wasn't interested in numbers or crowds. And the point being that anybody, anybody should be elated at a response like this, but not Jonah. Jonah wasn't, not at all. He knew God's work was gracious. He knew God's work was kind. And instead of being grateful for it, he utterly melts and falls apart in anger. And then look what he says. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. And he actually begs for death. He justifies his disobedience. He impugns God's character as if God's character flaws are responsible for this travesty of justice that is Nineveh. And then he actually begs for God to kill him. Lord, take my life. It's better for me to die than it is for me to live. Now, Jonah had thought that back in chapter 1. Do you remember? He said to the sailors, you're going to have to get rid of me. Push me overboard before this storm is going to calm down. Jonah was willing to die and to go down with a whole boatload full of people than to repent and turn around and see a boatload of people and a city spared. He wasn't afraid to die. He was willing to die. But then, at the last minute, while he was sinking down to the depths, he cried out to the Lord in his distress, and God saved him from death. And he was thankful that God saved him from death. At the beginning, he thought death was what he wanted. Death was preferable to life. But then he realized once he was on the verge of death that that's not what he wanted after all. And he thanked God for delivering him. Now he's back to the other side. Lord, just kill me. Take my life. It's better to me for me to die than to live. And Jonah, in his selfishness, actually would prefer death to not getting what he wants. Have you ever been there? actually preferring death than not getting what he wants. So selfish is he that death looks more appealing and appetizing to him than having to live with not getting what he desires. That's what sin does to you. Sin makes you and I pursue things that would be our destruction and run from things that would be our blessing. We run after those things that will starve us and kill us spiritually and we run away from those things which would feed us and nourish us and strengthen us spiritually. In our sin, we look at God's virtues and we call them vices. We look at our, ver our vices and we call them virtues. And then we actually want the things that would end up for our own destruction. I've said before, and I'll say it till the day I die, sin is an insanity. And the only person who cannot see the insanity of it is the person who is locked in it and can't handle it and can't deal with it. They're the only ones that don't see the forest through the trees. They're the only ones that don't go. And those of us who are on the outside, we look at it and we see, that is unbelievable. How could you possibly even think that or want that? And yet that's exactly what Jonah asked for. He asked for death. Can you think of another prophet that asked for death in the Old Testament? Elijah. 
Elijah asked for death, right? You may at first glance think that the two men were the same, but there's a distinct difference between Elijah and Jonah. Elijah prayed for death and wanted death not because he was successful, but because he thought he was a failure. I alone am left in all the nation of Israel. I'm the last one that hasn't bowed the knee to Baal. And Jezebel came and threatened his life, and he just got to the point where he thought it's all over with. I'm all alone. I'm by myself. He thought he was a total failure, and he prayed that God would take him. Jonah, on the other hand, asked for death because he was successful, not because he was a failure. Elijah was consumed for God's glory, and Jezebel's threat, and the the episode on Mount Carmel and the haunting over him of all of the loneliness and his being alone in all of his commitment and his his worship of God, that seemed to overshadow God's glory. And it was because God was not being honored that Elijah was vexed and wanted to die. But Jonah wants to die because God is being honored. He was being honored right there in Nineveh as people were getting saved and turning from their sin. And he had a fantastic opportunity right in front of him and he threw it away. Two men were nothing like each other, were they? Uh, they lived very near the same period of time, you'll remember. Jonah lived just a few years after Elijah. I want you to read this whole prayer one last time, and I want you to notice something, and I'll emphasize the words. Verse 2. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God slow to anger and abundant loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. Eight times in those words, Jonah mentions whom? Himself, right? It's all about me. It's his desires, what he wants, his viewpoint, his actions. It's all Jonah, Jonah, Jonah. And he does, you say, but he does talk about the Lord. He describes the Lord. Very orthodox description of the Lord. Yeah, but he describes the Lord only enough to impugn his character. And to even show how that was a defect in God's character. How self-centered is this prophet? How self-centered? And I want you to look at God's reply, God's answer to Jonah in verse 4. Very simple, very straightforward, very humbling. The Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Do you have good reason to be angry? Do you have a right to your anger, Jonah? And later on, the Lord's going to ask him the same question again. You'll notice here that Jonah doesn't answer it. Why doesn't Jonah answer the question here? Does Jonah think that he has a reason to be angry? Well, he certainly does. He certainly does, but he doesn't answer the Lord here because the Lord has not turned up the heat, so to speak, enough on Jonah for Jonah to be able to see that he doesn't have a reason for his anger. But the heat is coming. God's going to do that, and he's going to make Jonah face the reality of his own heart. But here he just asked a very humbling, very simple, very straightforward, very convicting question. Do you have a reason for your anger? Do you have a right to it, Jonah? Give me a rational, legitimate, reasonable, right reason why you have to be angry. And let me ask it to you this way. Has God in some way not been gracious enough to you? That He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world? That He showered upon you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places? That He has adopted you now as a son and has given you all of the rights and all of the privileges of sonship, completely, freely forgiven you of all of your sins, past, present, and future. He has guaranteed your glorification. He called you to Himself. He granted you faith. He granted you repentance. And He keeps you for the, by His power for an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. Beyond that, He laid on His own Son all of your sin and punished His Son in your stead so that He could give you the righteousness of His Son. And every spiritual blessing that you can name and more that will yet to be revealed to you, He has given to you all things in His Son. He who is not withheld from you His own Son will freely with Him give you all things. Has He not been gracious to you? Do you have reason to be angry? Do you have reason to be angry with the material benefits that you have enjoyed? To this very day, He's given you health and life and food, and supply, and provision, and peace, and prosperity. And He has showered upon you the grace of His entire creation. And all of it is here for our enjoyment. And you enjoy pleasures beyond number from the day of your birth till this day. Has God not been gracious to you enough in physical blessings? Or is it the fact that God did not ask your counsel in some aspect before He moved? Was God not gracious enough to condescend and say to you, Jim, what do you think about what I'm about to do? Would you be my instructor? Would you be my counselor? Would you tell me the wise course to follow in this, in this endeavor? 
Has God in some way, in any way, slighted any person in this room? The person who's angry with God would put their hands on their hips and say, yeah, I have a reason to be angry. And that very response shows how foolish, how hard-hearted, how arrogant, how selfish, how self-centered you are. And I am. Every step, every even rising of emotion of anger in my being toward God for anything is a sin that is so hideous, so profane, that it almost defies description. We had a discussion last week after the service. Somebody, we were talking about complaining. And I'll tell you something. I, I can't stand complaining people. They do nothing but complain, complain, complain. They hate that. You can't stand being around them. They, all they do is bicker and complain about this, and they complain about that, and they complain and complain and complain. I don't like complaining people. In fact, I complain about complainers. That's how complaining I am. And I was just doing that very thing. We are talking about complaining and what... What is it in my own heart that makes me complain, and how should I view my own complaining? And, and uh, there was a group of us discussing this, and we kind of came to the conclusion, at least I did, that I think that the line is drawn when I am vexed or angry or complaining about something, and it's God's name or God's word or God's truth or God's glory that's at stake. That's legitimate. But the minute it is on me and my emotions and my doings and how I feel and how I perceive it and what is best for me, that's when it becomes sin. Has God done anything to anybody in this room that would warrant even a word of complaint? Nothing. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. That's Psalm 103. He has not dealt with us according to our iniquities. He has dealt with us according to nothing but grace. And we can be thankful to him, and we ought to be humbled by that response to God. By God, do you have a reason to be angry? We don't, do we? Let's bow our heads together. But, Father, we thank you for your grace to us. Though we complain and though we bicker and though we sometimes are angry for all of the wrong things at, at you and at all of the wrong reasons, we do know, God, that you deal with us according to your grace and your goodness and not according to our iniquities or our sins, which deserve so much worse than we have ever experienced. How can a man complain in light of his sins, Jeremiah asks. We say the same thing. We thank you that your grace to us, spiritually and physically, has been more than abundant in Christ Jesus. You are a good God, and help us to see your goodness. Help us to see that every defect in us is no virtue, and all of your virtues are nothing but virtuous. You are holy and completely other than us, and we thank you that you are in no way like us. We love you, and we praise you today in Jesus' name. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.